stage is preparing a base for the very pocket. I join basic poles for a future pocket with the help of a knitting needle. It is very important to keep these poles at the same level. I leave about four poles at each side in order to involve them in the process later gradually. So far I'm going to work with these central poles. How many poles are there left? Let's start by entwining the central four poles. At this stage it's time to engage a basic form, this ball I've shown you from the very beginning. I join it like this. It doesn't require any special fastening. I just place it here and shape my item based on this form. You can choose a different form. Anyway, your pocket will repeat the curves of your base. I'm going to weave a pocket in a standard rope-like technique, forward and backward. Well, actually you can apply any other technique, printed cotton for example. The challenge is, you have to be very attentive and try your best to avoid big gaps at the turning points. In my first item I got the gaps too big, so I had to mask them with the help of a braid. Take a look, please. I've got rather big gaps here at the turns, which looks rather ugly. Well, no problem, I've masked them. However, in my later works I've tried my best to avoid such failures. So I'm entwining four poles. When it's time to turn, in order to avoid a big gap, after I've entwined three poles, I lead a single working tube around the fourth pole. I mean you have to perform partial weaving. We've already applied this technique to turns many times, for example while weaving a cat's home. As a result, you get both tubes pressed tight to the weaving edge, which helps you to avoid big gaps. I continue and grab the next pole, with a single working tube again. As for the second working tube, let's turn it before you reach the last pole. This way. Continue. Hug the next pole. And continue weaving this way till there are four poles left here. Every time involving a new pole, entwining a base form and following its curves. If we continue weaving this way for the next four rows, our pocket will incurve and get shaped like this, not pocket shaped at all. So let me explain you in detail what to do in order to achieve the required convenient, smooth and nice looking shape. Let me share the technique I've discovered. So I've been weaving this way, involving one more pole in each following row, until I've got four vacant poles left from each side. 
The next thing we have to do is weave in a bigger central part. As for the edges, let's leave them unengaged so far. I mean we continue weaving in the same very way, but this time we leave an extreme pole unengaged every time. For example, I've got an extreme pole here, but I make a turn one pole earlier. And I'm going to get back in the same very way. I mean, I'm not going to weave up to the very end. Instead, I'm going to leave one pole unengaged in the first row, the second one in the second row, and the third one in the third row. I'll show you what I'm going to do next afterwards. So let's weave in the fourth word and backward rope technique, leaving one extreme pole and engaged in each row. Please take a look. I've left one, two, three poles, turned for the fourth time. Now I'm weaving further, pressing the current row to the previous one tightly and engaging the following pole, the first one of the four poles left. And continue weaving. I'm going to weave up to the end of the row, after which I'll make a couple more turns, not reaching the end. The thing is that if making accurate turns, I succeed in tightening the weaving so much that the gaps are almost invisible. If I turned here every time and engaged the extreme tube in every row, this kind of weaving technique is possible as well, but in this case the gaps would be too big. The technique of incomplete rows allows masking the gaps. Or let's say you have to distribute the poles equally and press the women with the following row. In this case you get the gaps very small. Grab the next pole, lengthen the working tube and continue. So having involved one more pole, the first one of the four, I have woven three incomplete rows, making turns in each row again. This way I'm lifting this upper segment. After three rows have been woven and we've turned for three times, Continue pressing the weaving in the turning points and grabbing the next pole of the four. And weave in complete rows with turns again, with one pole left and engaged in each row. This way we get many rows here, while at the edges we adjust the number of rows depending on our shape. I've counted the number of turns based on my experience following my form. If I got a form of a different shape, I would have to perform a different number of turns. Maybe I would have to make more turns or maybe to leave more vacant poles left here. It's up to every viewer to count by experience depending on their form. Having finished three rows with turns once again, let's weave a complete row involving the last pole but one. Once 
while weaving tighten the previous rows very carefully. Take a look, please. Actually, there are some gaps, but they could have been much bigger if I hadn't woven in complete rows. Let's take a look at the height. There are three incomplete rows with turns left to make and to grab the last unengaged pole. In this case we'll reach the required pocket height. So the pocket has been woven. Let's lead the remaining tails of the working tubes I've been woven forward and backward rope with to the wrong side. I'll glue and fasten them afterwards. So the pocket is ready. To my mind it's easier to cut the tails and stick a braid to the edge. 